Welcome to worship, living saints. Whoever you are and wherever you have been, you are welcome here. We are the Congregational Church of Birmingham United Church of Christ, and I'm Louise Ott, your pastor and friend. During Advent, we are on a journey to look at how God blesses each and every one of us with the ability to be transformed. The chimes of the clock tower bells in Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, provided a wake-up call for Ebenezer Scrooge and turned him away from his resentment, fear, and isolation. Each week, we hear the bells ring, just as Scrooge did on that transformative night. context in which Dickens placed his powerful Christmas story was 1800s England, a time of a great divide between rich and poor, something on which Dickens wanted to shed light. His main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, is clear as the story begins that the only redeeming value in life was in getting more money. He lives in resentment, fear, and the ice-cold frozen state of watching out only for himself. God's economy, on the other hand, says that there is enough for all, and all are worthy of the abundance of life and joy, freedom and sustenance. Will we? make a change, change into God's economy and move toward the richness of peace for all? And will we continue to be chained by the poverty of exclusion? Come together, together one, one and, and all, all in, in the, the giving, giving spirit. Gifts abound, abound here, great and small. small. Joyously we feel it. Blessings send us from above, guide us on our way. We raise our voice as we rejoice, bow our heads and pray. A miracle has just begun. God bless us, everyone. Let us pray. Holy living God, blessed Jesus, guiding spirit, we open today to this journey of past, present, and future, knowing that you hold, hold all of it in your hands. You hold all of us in your hands. Open us to the miracle just begun, and in this season, transform us into those whose giving brings peace into a turbulent world. Open us to you, to each other, and to the voices no one hears, so that your reign of mercy, justice, and love can be made known to all. To the voices no one hears, we have come to find you with your laughter and your tears, goodness, hope, and virtue. Family, parents, children, friends, each a treasure be. One candle's light dispels the night, now our eyes can see. Burning brighter than the sun, God bless us, everyone. Isaiah 9, 6-7 A child is born to us, a son is given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. 
we light the first candle on the wreath and remember the promise of peace. We have peace with God. We are surrounded by the spirit of peace. This peace has the authority to change our world forever. God of peace beyond our understanding. Guide our hearts that, that we may seek peace. Give us courage, know who we are, even if it means we may not look like warriors or winners in the world. Guide our hearts that we may seek peace. Come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Amen. Humbug! Merry Christmas! What right have you to be merry? What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. He was sitting there making change. A creditor with a cold heart. Making decisions about people's lives. Will they eat? Will they not? Will they have a roof over their heads? Will they not? Will their children live? Will they not? Will they go to debtor's prison? Will they not? It is a story born a long time ago and far away. Or is it? Still, we live in a world where there is a chasm between haves and have-nots. Hoarding and generosity. Privilege and oppression. Continue. Will they eat? Will they not? Will they have a roof over their heads? Will they not? Will their children live? Will they not? He was sitting there making change. And then 
at the toil of a bell, and the blink of a night, his life was changed forever. God, God has thrown, thrown the, the mighty, mighty from, from their, their thrones. Are we ready for such redemption? What will it mean? Facing our fears. Forgiving ourselves. Compassion for others. Working to change trajectories. Christmas is a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when people seem by one consent to open their shuttered hearts freely and to think of others different from themselves as if they were really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and it will do me good. And I say, God bless it. This week's theme juxtaposes the world's economy and God's desire for peace and justice for all people, especially those on the margins. What is the price for looking out for our own? And what is the benefit to making change in the ways God invites us? What is God's economy anyway? Let's listen as Lucy reads our second scripture of the week, Luke chapter 1. Mary said, With all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. God has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. God has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering mercy, just as was promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. And now we have a special time for children. I'm Carmel Tinnis, the Director of Christian Education. Today begins a special time when we get ready for the coming of Jesus. It is called Advent. It's a time of watching, a time of waiting, and a time of wonder. When we make room in our lives for Jesus, our eyes are open, our ears are open, and our hearts are open to the wonders of God's amazing love. Let's open our ears. I wonder what might happen. Did you hear that? I think that means we have a delivery. I wonder where it is. Look around. Do you see a delivery? Hey, look. It's a Christmas card next to the Advent wreath. And it's addressed to the children. That's you. Let's open it. The card says P-E-A-C-E. -E. That's peace. What a thoughtful message as we prepare for Christmas and the coming of Jesus. And there are different kinds of peace. There's peace on the outside that comes when people stop fighting with each other. Do you remember the sign for peace? It's conflict and resolution. And then there's the peace on the inside that comes when we feel all the way down to our toes, 
that God's love is there to hold us and comfort us. That's shalom, God's peace. Well, one of the best ways to feel that peace, that shalom on the inside, is by how we breathe. Did you ever notice how we have different kinds of breaths? Well, let's imagine that we're holding a mug of hot chocolate. Can we each hold a mug of hot chocolate? No, we can't even take a sip yet or it'll burn our mouths. Ouch, let's blow a cooling breath onto our mugs. Ah, now let's take a sip. Oh, that's more like it. Now, let's imagine we've been building a snow fort and our hands are so cold that they're tingling. Let's breathe our warm breath to thaw our hands. Oh, that's much better. Now, let's imagine we're very worried about something and we need to calm down with a nice calming breath. Let's all breathe in through our nose gently, then sigh out softly as we say the word peace. Let's do that again. Peace. Oh, that felt so good. Let's do that again, this time breathing peace for our whole church. Peace. Once more, this time, breathing peace for the whole world. Peace. Now during this season, we remember when one little baby changed everything. You may be young, but don't doubt for one second, through God's amazing peace, God shalom, you can help change the world. For our closing, we're going to do a simple calm call and response prayer. I will say something, and you respond by singing, Sleep in Heavenly Peace. This is the last line of Silent Night. Let's sing it together. Sleep in heavenly peace. Nice, let's try it one more time. Sleep in heavenly peace. Now, I'll lift my hands when it's time to sing and sing it with you. Let's pray. God of peace. Bring peace to our world. Sleep in heavenly peace. God of peace, bring peace to our church. Sleep in heavenly peace. God of peace, bring peace to our hearts. Sleep in heavenly peace. God of peace, make us ready for Jesus. Sleep in heavenly peace. And let all God's people say together, Amen. My soul gives glory.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our creator. Amen. Well, the New York Times has started dropping a new daily into my e email box. In her words, got my attention during a week when I was focused on the words of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary is newly pregnant. Mary tells us who she is and who God is. In her words, she loves God from the depths of who she is, a woman, a daughter, an expectant mother, promised to Joseph, a creation of God. She trusts God to be her savior. What kind of savior? Who is God for this poor, unwed mother? The language is spare and active. God has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. God has come to our aid, remembering mercy. Now, these words were most likely taken from both Jewish and Christian worship traditions. They have a well-worn and often used feel to them. The gospel writer is borrowing Luke, the physician author, would have heard these worship words of the early church. The rhythm is smooth, trips easily off the tongue. It's a song, it's a poem put into the mouth of Mary. In her words, Mary answers the question of what affects the arrival with the advent of God's economy. Yes, it's Advent already, the first Sunday of the new Christian year. And it all begins with waiting. We wait for the world to be safe again. We wait for handshakes and hugs and long conversations in our living rooms. We wait to attend concerts, weddings, dances. And we wait for an end to premature deaths. We wait for God's economy to become our own. These are the ancient words of prophecy, a justice made in God's image. God has pulled down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. God has come to our aid, remembering mercy. Can our economy, based on survival of the fittest, transformed to reflect what scientists now know? That species which adapt and cooperate have a better survival rate than the dominating and self-sufficient? Okay, well, in short, I will just hawk again the book Braiding Sweetgrass. Have you read it yet? But what does our economy look like. A study released this week reported that Walmart and McDonald's have more employees on food stamps and Medicaid than all other companies who employ workers. Wow. And yet, Walmart reported a net income of five point one four billion for this most recent quarter. And McDonald's, they reported an income of 1.76 billion for that same period. Wow. It is encouraging to note that earlier this year, Costco, Amazon, and Target raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour on their own. Is this a step toward God's economy? I wonder. If you and I make $15 an hour and we work 40 hours a week, which in theory defines you know, a normal work week, 
And if we then work 52 weeks a year, which of course is not normal, healthy, or desirable, we will have $31,200 before taxes. And let's see, the average rent in Detroit is over $1,000 a month for 800 square feet of living space. If you add another 1,000 a month for utilities and phones, car payment and insurance, if you have a car, well then you have $4,700 left for groceries, healthcare, clothes, gas, emergencies. Wow. If we are advocating for a living wage, I'm thinking this might not even reach the level of God's economy. The paradox for Christians of all time is knowing God's economy and then living in a world which honors money as the ultimate symbol of God's blessings while ensuring some get more than others or maybe ensuring some get less than others. It puts our our hearts in an in ethical twist. How can we light the candle of peace when this reality is right in front of us? Well, perhaps we make the Scrooge journey. We make the character adjustment, don't we? We do what is within our power to affect. Now, I have to tell you, I was all set to talk about the CEO of Gravity Payments who decided to change the economy of his company and set a minimum salary of $70,000 a year. And while that part is true, and it began in 2015 with 50000 and then progressed to 60000 and then ultimately 70000 after further investigation, I discovered that the character within the CEO himself, was not doing this out of altruism. The story was concocted with motive. A friendly reporter wrote the story to say, Dan Price originally decided to make the change after a hike with his friend Valerie, who was struggling to pay her bills in Seattle, despite her working 50 hours a week and earning 40,000 a year, well over minimum wage. She was explaining to Mr. Price how a $200 rent increase was throwing her entire life into chaos. After the hike, he says, he kept thinking about the problem. I couldn't stand anymore to be leading a company that was having a third of its employees be in a worse situation than my friend Valerie. When these people are so very hardworking, very motivating, and they're doing all the things they're supposed to do, to not be able to make ends meet, it's just heartbreaking, he said. The shift to a $70,000 minimum wage followed earlier increases in pay. In 2011, after the company had recovered from the last financial crisis, it started giving employees much larger raises than it had in the past. And so by the end of 2012, salaries had increased by an average of 26%. Now Price expected that the company's profit margin would drop as payroll increased. But he claims profits went up. And the reason he claims that is because people were better able to take care of their financial needs and he believes that they were now better able to focus on their work. The story concludes by saying, we've proven a higher pay structure can work and thrive by tripling our business, he says. But unfortunately, we, we've also proven that individual voluntary actions like that will not solve systemic issues we're facing, end quote. It all sounded so much like God's economy. You can imagine my disappointment when I discovered the abuse of power and the self-aggrandizement attached to this whole scheme. The good news, there are more people making enough to keep house and home together. The bad news, 
and the move had an ulterior motive. It was publicity seeking, seeking approval to cover myriad abuses of power, temper tantrums, greed, and the physical beating of his now ex-wife. This makes even Scrooge look like the good guy. But Scrooge, Scrooge has the character to change, to recognize God's economy. Theologian Brian McLaren says, God's kingdom turns all of those associations upside down. Order becomes opportunity. Stability melts into movement and change. Status quo government gives way to a revolution of community and neighborliness. Policy bows to love. Domination descends to service and sacrifice. Control morphs into influence and inspiration. And vengeance and threats are transformed into forgiveness and blessings. Oh, to find this way to God's economy. The headline of In Her Words on Thursday was this. Today's capitalism is incompatible with feminism. It's a quote from Mariana Muzaccaro, a professor and economist at the University of College London. In her interview, she states, in Wales, Planned public sector projects are evaluated and appraised by the Future Generations Commission, which is mandated to make recommendations based on impacts on the yet, not yet born. You heard me, the impacts on the yet unborn. She goes on, in New Zealand, the government launched the first well-being budget in 2019. The genuine progress indicator attempts to separate environmental and social costs from benefits, so to value household and volunteer work and to adjust for inequality. Professor Mazzucato concludes her interview saying, I imagine a 2023 where we have not only beaten COVID, but used the recovery process as an inflection point toward a new world, which is greener, more inclusive, and more sustainable, fueled by smart innovation-led economic growth. This starts with public, in, public movements driving government bailouts to be conditional on maintaining payroll, securing minimum wage, halting stock buybacks, and ensuring worker representation on boards aligning company goals with worker goals. This dream extends to healthcare, which is notoriously inequitable. In my vision, she says, bold conditions are placed on the governance of intellectual property, pricing, and manufacturing of COVID-19 treatments and vaccines to ensure the therapies are both affordable and universally acceptable. End quote. Our scripture says, God has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. God has come to our aid, remembering mercy. What does Scrooge say in response to the needs of the poor? Are there no workhouses? <laughs> what is striking about Dickens' A Christmas Carol is the character development. We start with Scrooge and his currently cemented perspective of joyless work that holds no mercy. His wealth is not even a comfort to himself, so miserly he won't spare enough coal to keep himself warm let alone anyone else. The story invites us to a journey of discovery with him 
and for ourselves. As we journey to the arrival of God with us, Emmanuel, we are called by the words of Mary to discover for ourselves whether God's economy has a place in our hearts, whether God's economy is the vision for our ministry as a congregation and our personal vision for a well-lived life. The nephew of Scrooge says it simply, that God's economy is being kind, forgiving, and charitable, though it may never put gold in our pockets. Well, friends, I'm happy to say that the nephew is alive and well in this congregation. We have gathered bags and bags and bags and pounds and hundreds of pounds of groceries for Lighthouse. And we gave another $1,500 so that the hungry will be fed, will be filled in God's economy. Now Mary, Mary seems at peace, even in the midst of this blessing, which equals hardship for her life, the blessing of this pregnancy, this baby. It is a hardship to live in an economy of profits over people, when we really believe in God's economy of enough for all. So we make the changes we can in our own household economies, and we demonstrate God's will of the lowly lifted up and the mighty, the miserly, dethroned. We celebrate employment housing and sustenance for the hungry and the rich being off camera. There is peace in remembering and emulating the mercy of God. There is peace in knowing God is with us. We are not alone. To pursue peace is to bring God's economy of mercy and equitable opportunities to life. May the coming of God's economy be our Advent and Christmas wish, a wish that we pray for with our giving, our engagement, and the change for good that the Scrooge in us all is waiting to discover. May it be so. We are not alone, we are not alone, we are not alone, God is with us, we are not alone, we are not alone, we are not alone, God is with us, we are not alone.
As part of our prayer ritual in this season of Advent, we invite you to create chains made of ribbon or paper and to place them somewhere prominent in your home, perhaps on a Christmas tree if you have one. And these chains represent like the ghost of Marley's chains, those things we hope to let go of that weigh us down and create our miserly, fearful attitudes in our lives. Each day you are invited to unleash one of these chain links and to name to yourself or to someone else or to write on that piece of ribbon what you are working on letting go of. So save those pieces and we'll address them on the first Sunday after Christmas. Now, let us give thanks to God and offer prayers for ourselves, for one another, and all of creation. Let us pray. O oh God of peace, your vision for an economy of equity still lives on in these ancient texts and the dreams for our children. Melt our hearts and steal our nerves for the revolution which is your call upon our lives. Make Marys of us all, singing of your power to save and our power to love you and each other. Hear our prayers for those who struggle and suffer and need to know the presence of your healing spirit. Hear our prayers for those whose poverty is a product of unjust economies. On the tail end of this national holiday of giving thanks, we open wide our spirits to be grateful for every breath, every moment of laughter, every tear shed in grief or joy, the gift of loving and being loved. We give thanks and accept your peace which passes all understandings. And we join our hearts and voices to pray as Jesus taught us saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. Thank you. Thank you for worshiping God with us today. We are an open and affirming congregation welcoming you and declaring you belong. Please say hello in the YouTube chat or leave us a comment. You can subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can find us easily. For all that we offer as God's economy to the world, we give out of love and joy. Whether you give online, lend your talents or time, send gifts through the mail, we make change for the sake of God's mercy. Let us pray. Generous God, we give you thanks for all you have given us, and we offer our gifts, our gifts of love, of time, talents, and treasure. We offer you the economy of our lives for the sake of being your hands and feet to be the body of Christ. Open us to even more ways to give so that we might make change and be changed for the sake of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
a little Scrooge in each of us, yearning to thaw, yearning to love again. This week, may you be visited by a surprising peace that may surpass your understanding. And when you feel it, even if for just one fleeting moment, know the miracle has just begun in you for the sake of the whole world. May you know you are blessed by our God who loves you deeply, by Jesus, the true gift of God to each of us in this season and in all our days, and the Spirit who shows up just in time. Friends, God's peace is with you and with me always. Amen. <laughs>